Okay, so uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I think we can start. Probably someone, someone else will join later on. Um, so just before we start, uh, I want to, to tell you that we are going to record this webinar, so you can find the recordings by tomorrow on our website, along with the with the input files that we are going to create. And um, in this example, in, in today's webinar. Uh, we are going to talk about um, micromodeling of masonry, more specifically on the on how to model the out of plane behavior of masonry using shell elements, and a particular plastic damage model that we implemented in OpenSeas. And and also I'm going to show you how to use uh, how, to, how to run a parallel analysis with OpenSeas, in particular with OpenSeas MP. So I'm going to share my screen, and we can start. Okay, so this is what we are going to do today. Um, this is the numerical simulation of an experimental test that you can find on this paper, and I will send you the reference. You will find the reference on um, the content files that you will see tomorrow on our website. Basically, those guys tested uh, the out of plane behavior of our reinforced brick masonry walls uh, using different, uh, different kind of walls. We are going to test only the wall number one. So this kind of wall here, which is pinned on all the sides. It has a vertical pre-compression. We are going to do this example with a 0 0.1 megapascal of vertical pre-compression. And well, here you have all the, all the data, material parameters, all the details about the experimental setup. And I will show you how to do this kind of model in STKO and OpenSeas. Okay? We're going to do everything with shells, and I want to focus on how to choose the proper uh, shell element formulation when you are doing uh, micro modeling. So before starting with this, with, this, with this example, I will show you what is the difference between a uh, thick shell or a thin shell, because in OpenSeas you have both formulations, when it comes to micro modeling because uh, it makes a huge difference. So we'll start with a very simplified model. So I want to close this one. And then of course we will move to the real simulation, which is this one here. Okay. So when you open STKO, you can start from the preprocessor and we are going to simulate a very simple uh, specimen and load it in the out of plane, in the out of plane direction. And I'm going to compare the results given from the thick shell and the one given from the thin shells. We will see that they will give different results. So we will try to understand why and what of the two formulation uh, represent better the results given by the 3D, the same 3D simulation. So here uh, in the contents file that you will have here, you will have two folders. And then of course the reference here, uh, the first folder you will see all the input files for the element comparison, which is what we are going to do now. And then in the OOP URM wall, you will have the real simulation. So let's start by creating a new folder called LA comparison. And in this folder here, you will find a, an input, uh, a simple CAD input file so that we don't have to create it from, the, from scratch. So we, we don't waste time. So when you, want, when you want to import some geometry, because in the previous tutorials, I've all, I already explained how to create geometry starting from, from zero. Here in this tutorial, we show you how to start from an input geometry, for example. <laughs> and the first thing that you can do is to load the base drawing direct. Okay. This one is the uh, surface. Uh, just give me a second, I want to mute everyone, otherwise it would be complicated. Okay. Uh, just a second. If someone has the mic on, can you please switch it off? Here. Okay, so this is the first surface. Okay, you already know if you, if you have seen our tutorials on how to create this kind of surfaces. So we start from this one and we can rename it as shell. Because we are going to compare different 
uh, different geometry. So it is easier if you rename the geometry with the name. So we're going to use this one for the tick shell. So let me rename it as shell tick. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is to create some material parameters. So let's go in property. Uh, first, we are going to create a material parameter brick. So this one will be brick 3D. Uh, let me go in full screen, sorry. Okay, so brick 3D, and here we go under materials, ND, then we go under plugin, and we choose as the software damage TC 3D. Okay, so here you have all the material parameters. We start with the young modulus for the brick, which is 5 to 700. Okay, and then 0 0.15 Poisson ratio. Then you have the parameters for the tensile response. So uh, two megapascals. Oh, uh, by the way, um, as you know, in OpenSeas and in STKO, you don't have the concept of unit system. So you have to be consistent. In my model, I'm going to use Newton and millimeters. So here you have the fracture energy uh, per unit area. So 0 0.05 in this example. And then here you have some parameters for the compressive behavior. This one is the limit. Uh, I think we have, a, we have a question here. Okay. Um, so here we have 30, 40. This is the peak strength. Then we have the residual strength, which is 10. Then the strain at peaks deformation. And if you don't know any of this material, you have the description down here. So as you click on one of the attributes, you have the description. Okay, so this one is 0 0.002. Then you have fracture energy and compression, which is 10. Then these parameters are fine with the default values. Here you have some miscellaneous values. Um, the, the shape of the tensile surface, which can be the ranking or the Dubliner, while in compression, you have only the Dubliner surface. Then some parameters here are find the default. We are going to use only damage. These two parameters are to calibrate the damage part and the plasticity part in the model. Now, in this case, we don't need any plasticity, so we put zero and zero. So we have a pure damage model, both intention and compression. Then this one is very important, the integration scheme. The default is the implicit. So it would render the problem a nonlinear problem. Uh, basically, every internal variable depends on depends on linearly on the strain. Um, otherwise, you have another integration scheme, which is inflex. Here you have the description that basically is a mixed implicit explicit integration scheme, where during the iteration, basically the internal variables do not depend on the current strain, but they are linearly extrapolated from the internal variables at previous steps. And then you have an implicit corrector before saving the internal variables for the next step that basically tries to reduce the error of the explicit method. So we're going to use this one because this one is always convergent and makes the problem stepwise linear. Then you have another optional attribute here, which is automatic regularization. As you know, whenever you have um, material models with softening behavior, um, the response depends on the mesh size. Uh, so basically what this kind of, what this option does is that whenever you have this automatic regularization checked, the values that you input here, which are uh, the real fracture energy, they will be divided by, automatically in open seas, they will be divided by the characteristic length of the element, okay? In such a way that at least the amount of energy dissipation is independent from the mesh size. Okay, and this is called fracture energy regularization. Okay, so this is the, these are the parameters for the, uh, for the brick. And of course, here you have the material test if you want to test how this model is working. For example, if you want to do a monotonic test in tension, like for example, 0 0.01, and you want to push it in tension, and you see how it behaves, then the same, you can do the same in compression. Okay, and you do all your tests. Perfect, so this one is fine for concrete. Uh, sorry, for brick, then you are going to create the same for mortar. So mortar. And as you see, we start here from creating 3D models. Then we are going to create the shell ones. 
but this one are the initial uh, three-dimensional models. So material and the plugin as the software damage TC3D. And for the mortar, we have 1000 as young modules, 0 0.15 Poisson ratio. Then we have 0 0.1 as tensile strength, and 0 0.025 uh, fracture energy in tension. Then we have one as the elastic limit in compression, 2.5 the peak strength in compression, and one the residual stress in compression. Then we have 0 0.02 uh, strain at peak strength. And we have 20 as uh, fracture energy in compression. Once again, these three parameters are just used to, sh to uh, define the shape in compression, but this one are fine. I think we have another question here. Okay, so the GTF considers, yeah, th this is what I told you. So the, here you have two options. If you check, which is the default, automatic regularization, then this one is the real fracture energy per unit area. Okay, so basically is the area under the stress displacement curve. Okay? And then OpenSeas will take care of dividing this by the element characteristic line, but only if you specify the automatic regularization. If not, and here you have all the description, if you switch it off, then this one should be input already as a specific structure energy, okay? So the default value, of course, is to use automatic regularization and input fracture energy here, okay, as work per unit area. Okay, uh, let me go here. So we have the compression is done. Uh, miscellaneous parameters, here we have, this, this one is fine. This one is a parameter that controls the dilatancy of the model. Basically, when it tends to zero, uh, it has more dilatancy. When it tends to one, it has the minimum possible. You can find um, a description of this in my paper, and I have it here, and I will send it to you. Um, show you. You can find it here. Okay, so here you have all the details of the material parameter, the all the material parameters that we have here, all the testings. Uh, here there is a test to understand how the development in this model works. <laughs> read this paper and try to understand uh, all the parameters and what they exactly do and how it is implemented, okay? Okay, so back here, this one is fine. Then as I asked for the brick model, we don't need any plasticity. So we put zero everywhere here and we use the inflex method. Oh yes, just a second and we move to everyone. Okay, so here we are. I think everyone is muted now. Okay, so once again, we are with the inflex automatic regularization and we are fine also with the mortar. Perfect. So here we have these two three-dimensional models. Now, since we want to use a shell, we need to create a shell cross-section. And since this material is no linear, we need um, a discretized cross-section made of fibers, which in OpenSeas is called layer shell. So we go here, this time the shell is a, is a section, so we call it shell section. Okay, quick shell section. We go under model sections and we choose layer shell. Okay, so here basically we can decide how many layers we want and all the different materials. Now, in this example, the entire wall. It has a thickness of 110, and we want to use just five layers. So I choose five, and for each of them, I choose the brick 3D model. So five layers of brick 3D. And also here, we choose five layers, 22 millimeters each one. Okay, we are fine. And now we can clone it to create the other one for mortar. So clone it and then edit. 
Let me change the name in mortar shell section. Perfect. So the thicknesses are already fine because, it, of course, it has the same thickness. So five layers, 22 millimeters each one. And then here we change the materials with the mortar 3D. Okay. So we are fine with the material parameters and now we can start assigning them. So uh, here we, you have only one geometry, so you cannot just select it and drag and drop one material. Otherwise, you will assign the material to everything. Now, what you need to do here is to use the sub selection in such a way that you can assign a different material to each of the sub phases of uh, this composite surface. So how do you do this? Here in the top right corner of the graphic window, you have a series of buttons that basically allows you to change the, the selection. For example, this button here says, select the entire geometry. If you switch it off, now you can select the single components. And now here I can select both phases, edges, vertices. Now in this case, I only want to select phases because I don't want to make mistake assigning these, param these material parameters to the wrong geometry. So I can switch everything off, everything but faces. So I can select only faces here. And in this case, it was starting with brick, brick. Okay, so I select everything for the bricks in this pattern and this one as well. And then I drag and drop the brick shell section. As you drop it, you will see that they become from transparent. They get the color of this one. Um, then we do the same for the mortar section. So I'm going to select all these other faces. And that joins. And we drag and drop the mortar shell section, okay? Now we have been kind of unlucky here because the color are chosen randomly, but they are pretty similar. If you want to change the color because it's easier for you to visualize the different material, you can go here and change the diffuse color. So we choose something like this one. Okay, so you see a difference. <clears throat> okay, perfect. So now we have uh, the entire geometry and the physical property properly assigned. Okay, now basically in OpenSeas, you have all these physical properties that basically define the constitutive behavior of your model. And now of course you need to define the element properties. The element properties instead define the finite element uh, formulation that you want. Um, in many software, you don't have to do this because you have just one finite element for each kind of geometry. But in OpenSeas, you have many of them. So you have to choose which kind of finite element you want to use. Now, in this example, we are going to use the shell MITC4, which is a shell element for thick plane plate bending formulation. So we call it shell thick. And we go under model, um, shell elements. And we choose the shell MITC4. Okay. Now, basically, here, the, the original shell elements in OpenSys does not have this parameter. But basically, they used a very high stiffness for drilling. Uh, while in the reference paper, they used, they suggest to use a smaller value. So here in this version that you can download, uh, you can set up a scaling parameter for shell. And by default, we use the 0 0.01. Okay. Uh, this is a minor details because it only affects the in-plane behavior. In this case, we are going to work in the other plane, so it is not so important. Okay, so we want to, to use this one for all these phases. Okay, so all of these elements will use the thick shell. So we drag and drop it. And if we change the color from physical property to element property, you see the color of this one. Okay, perfect. Now we need a couple of other things to apply some boundary condition here. I will explain you later, but basically we are going to apply, to apply a, um, a rigid beam on both sides, both sides. And then we are going to apply a, a, an imposed rotation. Okay, so basically, how do you assign a beam to this side of a shell? Well, it's pretty easy. Now, it's easy in this case because beams and shell have the same degrees of freedom. So you can just create another element, assign it to the uh, boundary edges of a shell, 
and then STKO will generate an element from these boundaries, okay? If you have to do the same with solids, and we will see it later, you have to do something different. So let's start by creating a, an elastic section for the beam, and we can call it uh, a stiff beam section. And we choose section elastic because we don't need this beam to be nonlinear. We just need it to, to make the two sides stiff. And we use 2.2 to the power of 9 here and 8 to the power of 8. So it corresponds to a Poisson, Poisson ratio of 0 0.25. This is fine. And we choose a cross section. Uh, we choose it as a box cross section, user defined, and this should be 110, the thickness of the wall, and 20 millimeters in the other direction. Okay, perfect. So now we can just select, in this case, I switch off the selection of faces and I switch on the selection of edges, and I select all these edges here and here, and I drag and drop the beam elastic section. And now you can see the exclusion of them, okay, just to make sure it is properly assigned. Then, of course, we need to do the same for the element property. So we go here and we add the rigid beam element. We go under model, beam column elements, and we just need an elastic beam column, okay? Of course, we are working in 3D, so we choose 3D. Kinematics is fine linear. In this case, we are not using any nonlinear kinematics, so this is fine. Now we need to assign this element to the beams. Now instead of going and selecting them again, you can actually reuse the selection of this one. So you can go here, select, and then you drag and drop the beam element as well. So now we have everything set up for uh, this first uh, model. This one will be the thick shell. Um, now we copy it and we do the same for the thin shell. So we are going to do a comparison. Uh, but before doing it, I, will, I want to apply all the boundary conditions here. So we are done with the first model and then we copy it and we do the other one. So what kind of boundary condition do we need here? Um, I first need to, let me go in, okay, here. Then I go in condition. So I switch off the representation of the properties and now we are in condition. Now the first condition that I want to apply is a fixity on both sides, uh, fix. And basically, I want to fix everything. So I go under constraint, <clears throat> single point constraint, fix. And I go in 3D and displacement rotation, because of course, I need to fix both displacement and rotation of these things. And I will fix everything but the rotation about the y-axis, because in that case, we are going to apply an imposed rotation. So I want to fix all these degrees of freedom along this edge and this edge. And then I press OK. So we have this boundary condition here. Now the second boundary condition is an imposed rotation of 0 0.001 radians on these two points. Okay. Well, of course, I can apply the imposed rotation to the entire edge. But I prefer to apply it only on one point here because, by the way, this beam is almost rigid compared to everything else. So add. Let's call this Ry is equal to 0 0.001 radians. Uh, to apply an imposed rotation in open seas on imposed displacement on in, in general imposed degrees of freedom, you go under load, single point, and SP, okay? Prescribed nodal value. As usual, we go in 3D and six degrees of freedom displacement plus rotation. And we choose only the RY and we assign the reference final value, which is 0 0.001. And then before closing the condition editor, we need to select the two points where I want to apply this rotation, here and here. Here I want to apply rotation on the same direction. So one side of the shell will go up and the other will go down, okay? And then I press OK. So I have all this boundary condition here. Now we are pretty much set. I want to clone this one. So I can create the other model just changing the finite element formulation. So I click on copy. I select the entire geometry and I want to copy it, let's say here. Now, when you copy, basically you can, you can see that 
everything that has been copied has already all the property assigned, okay? So only thing I need to do is to go in selection of faces, then I create another element, which this time will be the shell thin, because we want to do a comparison between the thick shell and the thin shell formulation. So we go on the shell and we choose the DKGQ. DKGQ is basically the same as the MITC, so a shell with four nodes, but with the thin plate bending formulation, so Kirchhoff, against the Reisner Midlin of the MITC. Okay, this one has no parameter, so you can just select the model and press OK. And now I select all the faces here. Make sure you have only faces selected, otherwise you will see an error. And then you drag and drop the shell theme. Okay. So these two models are basically the same, only define Italian formulation changes. Now we need to do an extra thing. Whenever you define condition and you copy a geometry, the conditions are not copied, okay? So you need to, to assign them also to the, to the other sides. How do you assign them? For example, the fixity has been assigned on these two edges, but I want to include also these other two edges. So I click on Edit. And as you can see, when I click on Edit, STKO will automatically select the previous selection, and then I can just simply add new items to the selection. Then I press OK, and I will see the condition also here. And then I do the same with impose rotation. So edit, and I include these two points. OK, perfect. So now we have all our models set up. We have all the physical, we have the geometry, of course, physical properties, element properties, boundary conditions. Boundary conditions, they are just defined. Now, everything that we need to do is to create the analysis steps. As you know, the analysis steps are basically the way all the analysis stages will be written in the tuple file. So, first of all, before creating the analysis steps, you know that we are going to do a nonlinear analysis. So, the load, in particular, this in post rotation, will be applied incrementally. So, we need a time series in OpenSeas. A time series, for those who know OpenSeas, is basically something that can be used, among other things, as load multipliers. So, in this case, we go in definition and we choose a linear time series because we are going, we are going to apply this load monotonically. So, we choose linear. And we are fine with the default. So a linear ramp that goes from zero to one, from time zero to time one. Okay, so now you're ready to go into the analysis steps. Now, usually the first analysis step I create is the recorder, because typically I want to record everything since from the very beginning. Um, just a second, I will, I will mute everyone. Give me a second. Okay, so back to here, uh, recorder. So you go under uh, model, recorders, and PCO recorder. Basically, this one is a special recorder that we put in OpenSeas to create a single database output that we use for uh, the post processing in STKO. And we choose a name, let's say LA comparison. Uh, then we choose what to record. In this case, we just want to record displacement and rotation, reaction force and reaction moment. We don't need anything else. Uh, okay. So second step is to apply the boundary conditions. Now this analysis is pretty simple. It's just one analysis step. So we apply all the boundary conditions at the beginning. So add boundary conditions. We go under model, pattern add pattern and we want to add a constraint pattern. Now on the constraint pattern you can select how many single points you want and how many multi-point constraint you want at this point of the analysis. Now we just have one single point constraint so we make room for one and we choose the fixity here and press OK. So this one is the only constraint that we have. Then we want to apply the loads. Now in this case a load is an applied displacement but it is always a load. So we go under here, we choose add loads, model, pattern, add pattern, load pattern this time. This one is pretty similar to the constraint pattern. Now in this case, we can add loads, element loads or single point constraint. Now in our case, the only load that we have is a single point constraint, so we go here. We have just one and we apply the RY 
And of course, we have to choose a time series. That's why we created the linear time series and we choose it here and press OK. And now we are ready to create the analysis. Uh, so let's go here and create analysis. And in this case, we choose a analysis command. It will be static. I want to use a penalty method because for me it's the most general one. In this case, I want to use one to the power of 15 based on the stiffness that I have here. Uh, now we are going to use the uh, sequential open seas. So the default one, the default number, the default system is fine in this case. Newton scheme. Uh, pay attention that whenever you use the penalty method, you don't have to use any test command on the unbalance. Otherwise, you will never reach convergence here. So typically, when I choose penalty method, I use the, the test on the norm displacement increment. 1 to the minus 4 is fine. 10 iteration. I, we, we don't need them because it should converge in just two iteration. And I want to print the convergences. So I activate the print flag and I put 1 here. And then let's say I just want to use 10, 10 steps. I don't want to do more. Uh, this one is not a detailed analysis. I just want to show you the difference between the two, the two uh, element formulation. So 0 0.1 of increment and 10 steps. And we are fine. Now, everything we need, of course, let me save this file because I, I never saved it. And then comparison. Okay, everything we need to do now is to mesh it. Okay, so whenever you mesh it, the first thing that you need to do is to assign a global seed. A global seed is basically the average size in the entire model. And in this case, I just want to use a uniform distribution by size, and I want the element to be more or less 10 millimeters large, which is, by the way, the thickness of the mortar joint. So I press done. Then if you want to assign different meshes in different locations, you can use the edge seed. <clears throat> but in this case, it's fine, the global seed. Next thing that you need to do is to assign the mesh controls. In the mesh controls, you basically decide what algorithm to use, unstructured or structured, what topology to use, triangle or tetrahedra or quadrilateral and hexahedra, and then the order of interpolation of displacement, linear, quadratic, or serendipity. Now, in this case, we have only phases, so I don't phase. And I want to use structure and quad hexahedra and linear, of course, here. So I select all the faces and I press assign and then done. Perfect. Now I can just build the mesh. Okay. So this one is my mesh. If you want to switch off the nodes, you can see it in details. This is fine. Now you have here another command which is called partition. This one is, is done for, is useful for parallel analysis. So I will show you in the real example. This example is not necessary because it is quite small. Uh, now, I just to make things faster, actually, I just want to use a coarser mesh, actually. So we, are, we don't waste time. So 30 done, build mesh, OK? And then I go on to the analysis. Now, if you install the OpenSys that I told you, STKO will automatically find it because this, that one will be located in C, OpenSys solvers, OpenSys and the parallel version, which is OpenSysMP. If you don't, because you have your own version of OpenSys, you can still import your own solver. You just need to specify the path here. OK, so the first thing now, whenever you have something here, some new solvers imported into the kit, you can select it here. And in this case, I want to use the sequential OpenSys, not the OpenSysMP. So I'm going to save the entire file and run the analysis. OK, let's wait a couple of seconds. Now, as you can see, the implex method converts just in a couple of iterations. Actually, there is something in OpenSys for which if you do a displacement control, it takes one extra iteration, but it's the same. It's basically because in one iteration, the residual goes down, and the other iteration, the displacement goes down. I have to understand why it is happening in OpenSys, but it is fine. So once your analysis is done, you go in post-processing. And you can import the input file that has been generated. That is here. Now we are working on uh, we are working on this folder, LA comparison. And basically, you will see that the OpenSys will generate a file called MPCO with the same name you decided into the recorder. Okay. So you go here, open database, and you choose the file that has just been created. Okay. 
So it will import it here. By default, it will create a new plot group with a new, with a default plot, which is the deformed shape. Now, in this case, we want to see a surface color map. You can do it from here or here. And I want to show you the differences between the two formulations. So remember, this one is the thick shell formulation. This one is the thin. Now, what's the problem? Let me increase the deformation a little bit. Okay. So as you can see here, when you use the uh, thick shell formulation, uh, as you know, in the thick shell formulation, you have um, the element has out of plane uh, shear strains. And since the material model we are using is 3D, the out of plane strip shear strain can make it fail in the out of plane direction like this. Okay. So if I show you the animation of this one, you can see what's going on. While in this other case, the element does not provide any shear deformation. So it sends a shear deformation equal to zero to the underneath material. And basically this one, as you can see, is a, shows a much stiffer response and it cannot fail actually in the other plane direction. Now, so you can see the difference is very high. Now, why, why is this happening? You may say, okay, but these two shells can seem thin. Yes, they are, but since you're doing micro modeling, now if you go into the details here, you can see that there is a very high differences in, um, in stiffness and also in strength property between the two materials. Then if you take the soft material, which is the mortar one here, it has an in-plane size, which is 10, this characteristic size, while the thickness is even larger. So that's why the thin shell formulation is not working in micromodeling, especially in those cases. Now, of course, you may say, okay, but I see two different results. How do I know that this one is the best one is the most realistic one now to make sure this one is the is the best one we are doing we are going to do the same example with solids as you know the solids does not have any assumption on the other plane uh, behavior it is a complete formulation so we do a comparison with the solids and we can understand if it is better to use the thick shell or the thin shell okay so we go back here and we try to create the solid one now so um I go in geometry and I start by copying um, this geometry here. So click, right click, and then I want to copy it on this other side. Okay, now I need to change something because now this one, of course, is a, is a shell. Now I need to create a solid out of this, this surface so I can use the extrude command. Now, as I told you, the entire thickness is 110. Now I want to extrude it half on this direction and half on the other direction because I want to use a mid node to apply the rotation. So I select the entire geometry. As you can see, every time you start a new command, STKO says, tells you what to do. So select geometry, this one, right click. And then now I'm, I'm extruding it. And since I want to extrude normal to the plane, I can fix the orthogonal constraint. So I can go here and I press 55, which is after thickness and then right click, okay? Now I can get rid of the original surface. I don't need it anymore. So I can press cancel, okay? And now I can copy this one, right click from here to here. Now, basically we have, as you can see, two geometric, two geometric pieces. Now they are separated but I want to make them connected. So let me switch off the grid for a second. If I keep those two geometries separated, also the mesh will be separated. Now, of course, I want the mesh here to be attached. So I go here and I choose the Boolean operation, merge. So I click on merge and I select the two solids and then right click. Wait a second for the Boolean operation. Okay, and now the resulting is a single geometry in such a way that the mesh will be connected for this geometry here. Okay, now we need to assign the property. Okay, because this one is a new geometry, it does not have any property. So, of course, instead of assigning the shell section, now we can directly assign the 3D. Now, in this case, those are uh, volumes. So, I switch off the face selection and I switch on the solid selection. And I do as I did before. So I select all the solids for the brick. Oops, not this one. 
Okay, all the solids for the brick and assign brick 3D. And then I select all the solids for the mortar joint. And I drag and drop it. Mortar 3D. Okay. So now next problem, as you've seen in, and of course we need the finite element formulation. So we go here and we choose a solid element. In this case, we want to use hexahedral element. We can have, we go under brick elements and we can choose between some formulation. This one is the standard one with eight integration points and we are going to use it. There is this one which can be slightly more performant, which is the single point reduce integration uh, hexahedral element. The problem is that it has the hourglassing control because this one, as you know, whenever you use a single integration point, the element has some zero energy modes and they are typically constrained using um, artificial uh, stiffnesses. This is fine because this artificial stiffness is small. The problem is that when you use damage models in which the strength goes almost to zero, the physical stiffness of the material goes almost to zero. And in those cases, it may happen that the hourglassing artificial stiffness is even higher than the physical stiffness of the material. So I do not suggest to use this kind of integration, uh, reduced integration elements when you have damage. Uh, okay, so the standard brick is fine. And I select all those bricks so that they have both physical property and element property. Perfect. Now we need to do uh, something else. As you can see in the shells here, we created some rigid beams. Now, of course, we cannot do the same. We cannot just select now the edge of the soil and the, the edge of the solid and, and assign the beam, because of course, solid has three degrees of freedom while the beam has six. So we cannot do it directly. So we can do something different. Now, I want to create some uh, two phases here and on the other side so that I can create an elastic rigid shell section, pretty much like this beam here. Then I will attach the, the face of the shell to the face of the solid using, using equal dot constraint only in displacement. And then I will apply the rotation to the shell. Okay, so how can you do this? I go here under geometry and I use the um, extract command. This command is used basically to extract subshapes from entire shapes. Now, in this case, I want to extract only the faces here. So I switch off everything but selection of faces. I go in the top view and I select all the faces on this side and all the faces on this side. As you can see, this is my selection. Right click. And then, as you can see now, I created, I duplicated basically the faces from the solids and I created two new uh, geometries that are basically detached from the solid. And in fact, as you can see now, I can move them. So I go under move. I just move them, uh, and I use this one, extra. I just move them over a small amount. Uh, I will show you why, and then I will move it back. So I repeat the comment, move. And I select the extra, and I move it on the right side here. Why I'm moving them apart from the solid? Because now it would be easier to create boundary constraints between the shell and the solid. And then when I'm done, I will attach it back to the solid. Okay, so now we have the shell tick. This one, I can rename it so it's easier to identify them. This one will be the shell thing. This geometry here is the solid. And these two geometries here, extract and extract, are the external plates. Okay, so first we go under uh, property. As you can see, they don't have any property. So we create now a section for an elastic shell, which is similar to this one from the beam. Now this beam, this elastic section for the beam had a two to the power of nine uh, young modulus. So here we do the same for the shell. And we call it rigid. Uh, rigid plate. Now, whenever you want to create an elastic section for a shell, you go under section and you choose elastic membrane plate section. And here we have 2 to the power of 9 for the young modulus, Poisson ratio is 
and the thickness will be 20 millimeters. Okay, and then select uh, these phases here. So I go in selection of phases, top view, and I select all these phases and all these phases, as you can see here, and I drag and drop the rigid plate. Okay. And now I need to assign a shell element to this one. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of element I have here because by the way, this one will be stiff. So I reuse the selection I had here and I drag and drop, for example, the thick shell. Perfect, so also the, the plates here have their formulation. Now, as you can see, they are detached from the soil, uh, from the solid. How do we attach them? Now, since they have different degrees of freedom, we cannot attach them physically using a Boolean operation. We need to use um, kinematic constraints. So how do you do this in STKO? You need to create an interaction. So I go here, add. We add a node-to-node -node link, and we, choose, we call it, let's say, link. OK? And then STKO says, OK, select the master geometries. Now we want to select all the shell faces here as masters. And let me select only the faces, sorry. So this one will be the master, and this one will be the master, as you can see here. Then right click. Select slave geometries once again in top view, and I select all the boundary faces of the solid here and here. Okay, so right click, and as you can see, STVO will create some kind of distributed links all over the place, connecting every slave to the nearest master. Okay, so now we have the link. Uh, the next thing that we need to do is to create a condition, which is the multi point constraint for the equal DOF between the two. So we go under condition and we click on add and we call it EDOF. We go under model, constraint. This time is a multi point constraint and we choose equal DOF. We are in 3D. Uh, we don't need to choose the rotation because we don't want to select rotation. So I just need to select these three degrees of freedom. Only the displacement will be in common between the shell and the solid. So I select this one and I press OK. OK, so now my degrees of freedom are attached from uh, the translational degrees of freedom are connected between um, shells and solid. Now, of course, I created a new de degree of freedom here, but I didn't assign it to the analysis steps. Now, in order to make this one take part in the analysis, I need to go here. I press Edit. And here in multipoint constraint, I say, OK, in this stage, I also want to consider this other constraint, not only the fixity that I used before. So I press OK. Now we have basically all the conditions. We need to do something else. Um, we are in condition, yes. Now we need to apply the fixity that we applied here. So as you can see, if I click on here, edit, our fixity was applied only on the two sides of the shell. I want to apply it also on the mid edge of the shell. So I go here, I go in the front view, and I do a rubber band selection, selecting everything on this line. Okay, as you can see, it has been selected. I press OK. So my condition is also on these two edges. And I will do the same thing for the impost rotation, which is this uh, cyan dot here. So I go here, edit, as you can see, we have only these four points, and I want to include also this node here from the shell and this other node here. OK, and press OK. We are done. Now that now we have boundary conditions, we have the everything set up. Now we can safely go in geometry and move these two surfaces back to their original position. Now, actually, in this example, it doesn't make any difference. But just to be clear, I go and move. I select this one, right click, and I move it back to its original position. So basically, at the beginning, I moved it apart from the solid just because it was easier for me to select it. So I repeat the move common. I select this one, right click, and then I go back to the original position. Now we have everything. Of course, we need to set up the mesh 
for this one. So we go under mesh. Global seed is fine. We just need to assign the mesh controls to all the phases because now we have two extra phases here that by default are unstructured and triangular. So I go in structured and code hexa and I select all the phases. I press assign. Then I go on solids and same thing, structured code hexa and I select all the solids here, assign and done. Now I can safely build the mesh. Okay, so this one will be our mesh. Also, all the links from the um, from the interaction will be discretized and placed at the correct position. So I can save it and I can run the analysis. Okay, let's wait a few seconds. So we go back in the post processor and we reload the database. So right now we have also the results from the solid. And now we can see actually what's going on. No, I'm not in on both um, this, can, you, can you switch off the microphone? Okay, I will do it in just a second. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so this is the result. And now we can see what are the differences between the different models. Now, as you can see, the thick shell and the solid are actually behaving the same. So this is actually what I was saying. Um, the thick shell formulation, this kind of micro modeling is kind of very similar to the solid, to solid behavior. But instead, the, the thin shell formulation does not work so well. Now, let me decrease a little bit the formation. It's kind of too much, okay? So as you can see, the, the texture formulation is pretty, it's pretty good in this case, and it will save a lot of time. So that's why now in the next example, I'm going to use the texture formulation. So keep in mind that when you are doing a micro modeling um, and you have to choose between thin and thick shell, don't think about the fact that maybe you have a very large wall and you can consider it as thin, because what should be thin is actually the ratio between the, the zone in which you have the strain gradients. Uh, so basically in this case is the, is the size of the mortar, which is much smaller than the thickness of the mortar. So actually in this case, the thin shell does not work at all. So okay, uh, we can start a new post-processor and also in the pre-processing. And now we're going to do with the real simulation of the auto plane wall. I think we have a question. Okay. Two questions. Is large deformation considered? Uh, can the nominated generator be accounted for in the thin thin shell and solid elements? How is meshing done behind? Uh, no, okay. Um, you can do large deformation, but the problem in open seas is that now large deformation are only available for beams and shells, not for solids. So if you plan to use only, so only shells, you can do it. But in this case, I was using also the solid elements. And for the moment, there is no uh, large deformation for solids. Um, then how is meshing done? Uh, well, the mesh in this case, we are using a structured mesh, which, is, which has been developed by us. Um, if you want to, to know the, the formulation, it's called transfinite interpolation. Um, when we do um, a delunate triangulation for other kind of meshes, we use um, G, not G-mesh, but ng which is NetGen, basically. Okay, so let me go back. Uh, let me go back to, to share my screen, okay. Um, perfect, so let me start with the new example. Let's close it. Okay, now in this example, we are going to model this one. Uh, okay, this wall. Okay, so basically I will start once again. Oh, let me first create a new folder. You are an wall. And you will find all the files here in the OOP URM wall. 
And as usual, we will start with a base drawing and then we will start assigning everything. Now, in this example, I will show you how to do this model with shells, how to apply all the different boundary conditions that we have. And now we are, and then we will see uh, a couple of ex extra things. So how to do the analysis in parallel with OpenCSMP and how to use some custom scripts in the analysis to create something like this. So when you are, di when you are doing the analysis, instead of using the standard algorithm that, is, that has been using by, with OpenC, so you run all the steps at once, we run each step uh, one by one, and between each step, we write a file for the GNU plot so that we can monitor what's going on during the analysis, okay? And in this case, we are comparing the results of our micro model with the experimental results. Okay, so I, I will, I will uh, explain it uh, step by step. So the first thing that you can do in this example is to import the initial geometry. So I go in import and you can find it here, base drawing. Okay, now basically in this drawing you have um, a first cut drawing of the, um, of the RV module here, which is basically the, a couple of bricks and the mortar joints. So I can assign all the properties here and then I can simply copy them all around. And here you have the overall size of the wall. So I know where to stop when I start copying all the elements around. Okay, so let's say you have this kind of drawing. You want to create, as you can see, they are just lines. So what I want to do is to create surfaces out of, this, of these lines. And here you have a command called planner. This command is basically used to create planar surface out of a grid of planar curves. So you go on planner and I select all these lines and I press okay. And now I can get rid of the original lines. Okay, so now you have multiple, multiple surfaces already attached together. Why am I creating first this one and then I will copy them? Because in the previous example, I started with the entire geometry and then I assigned the material property uh, by hand, one by one. Now, in that case, it was easy because the model was small. But I imagine that if I have to select all the mortar joints inside an entire wall, it would take a lot of time. So instead, it's easier if I assign the material models here, the element models here, and then I copy paste all the pieces, and then I join them with a Boolean operation. So I go here, and I want to assign uh, bricks. So let me, of course, I need to I first need to create physical properties. So I will use the same example I used in the previous model. So brick 3D. I will go pretty fast now. I don't need to repeat them. Um, Plugin as the software, this is 3D. And this one is 700, 0 0.15, uh, 2, 0 0.05, and then we have 30, uh, 40, 10, 0 0.02. And we have 10 for fracture energy, then those default values are fine. Franking range is zero and implex. Okay, this is fine for brick. Then we do the same for mortar. Mortar 3D, uh, materials and D. Uh, plugin as the software damage to C3D. And this one we have 1000. 15. 0 0.1, 0 0.0, 0 0.25, 1, 2.5, and 1 of the residual strength, then 0 0.02 of peak strain, 20 uh, fracture energy compression, those default values are fine, then 0 0.5 here, and 0 plasticity, we don't need it, and the implex. Okay, so this is fine for mortar. It should be fine, yes. Now, as we did before, we need to create the uh, shell cross section. So once again, I go here and I choose brick section, model sections, layer shell, five layers of brick.
and five layers, 22 millimeters each one. Often this example is 110, so 22. And that's fine. I can copy, so clone, edit, and I change the name. So mortar shell sections. The thickness is fine, so I just need to change the material models here. So mortar 3D everywhere. Okay, let me double check it. Okay, so they are fine and I can assign them. So as I, as I show you before, I go in sub selection, only allowing selection of faces. And then we can start this pattern from uh, an entire brick down here, then those, and this one should be a brick as well. Okay, so I can drag and drop the brick section. Then I select the remaining faces for mortar joints. Mortar shell sections. Perfect. Now before going ahead, we can save it in this new folder. And we can call it model. Okay, so now we can start uh, copying them all around. So I go in geometry and I click copy. Uh, the entire size, actually we can copy it instead of copying it by clicking on the viewport, we can copy it using the distance. So for example, if you want to know something about the geometry, you can, you can ask, for example, here you have the command query geometry, and I want to know the length, the cumulative length of these edges. So I select all of them, I go in properties and say query length. For example, here it says, okay, the cumulative length is two, four, zero. So basically now I can, um, I can copy this one, right click, and then I use the orthogonal constraint is fine. I go here and I start writing 2.5, that's 240, 240, and so on. Now we just need to get rid of the last layer. As you can see, it is outside of the bounds here because the last layer, of course, is a, a, an extra layer of mortar, so we can get rid of it. If you want to remove something from a geometry, you can simply go here in sub-selection. You select only those faces. Uh, sorry, select only those faces and press cancel. So they will be removed. Now, before copying them around, we can merge them into a single face. Now in this case, the merge combat that I showed you before is the most general one that can merge solids, faces, and so on. But since here we are working with shells, with faces, there is a more, let's say, performant command, which is called SU faces, which is like the merge one, but only for faces. So I, cl I click on this one, and I select all these pieces down here, right click, so they will be merged into a single geometry. Okay. And as you can see, the properties are maintained. That's why I told you to start doing this and then copying them all around. Okay, so now we want to create the side walls. So I can go in geometry and copy. I want to copy this one. From here. Down here. And then I want to rotate it. So rotate it, but without creating a copy. So only transfer. I select this one and I go from here and then a 90 degree rotation. Perfect. Now if we switch on property, we can see that actually I need to, to make this one attached with this one if you want to be precise, because here we have the short brick that should coincide with the long mortar, with the long brick here. So we are in some selection of phases and I can get rid of these phases here. I press cancel so that now I can move, uh, I can 
I can, actually, when, when you want to create, when you want to issue a new command, you can either go there or you can type the, the command name here. And I move it down here. And then I get rid of all the extra geometries that are here. So cancel. So now put selection and I remove this one. Perfect. Now we can just, I think we can mirror it because here it finishes with the same short brick. Yeah. So we can just mirror this one. And we use mirror. What is it? Geometry. Um, mirror. And then we create a copy from here. Uh, let's say here, and I, I don't remember the mid side. Right click. And then I take this one and I move it. Okay, here. So if we go back in property, we see that the color matches here, that they're fine. Okay, so now we can merge them into as we did before. So we go here, see faces, select all of them, right click. So it's a single geometry. Now we can copy them um, in the up direction. As I did before, I want to know how much is this one. Let's say I don't remember the dimensions. So I go here and select these lines, query length. And it's 172. Okay, so I can go in front selection, in front view, and I click copy. And this one was 172. I repeat it multiple times. And then we need one extra layer and then we need to get rid of something there. Okay. So we need to get rid of the last two layers here. So we are under sub selection and I select all those faces. And then cancel. And then we are fine. Okay. So now we have all the surfaces. We can get rid of the base drawing so I can select it and press cancel. And now we can merge everything into a single geometry. So I go in, um, go here, see faces, and I select all of them. Right click, then wait for the Boolean operation, and you're fine. So if we go here in property, we can see that everything has been kept. So you have all your micro model done, okay? Perfect. Now we can do something something else. So first, let's save it. So as you know, physical properties are, are already set. Now we can create one single element property because here the entire model is made with shells. So we choose the shell. Uh, from the previous example, we understood that we need to use the texture formulation. So we use this shell MITC. This is fine. And we can select the entire geometry or all the phases like that and drag and drop the shell finite element. Okay, so we have the element here. Now we need to apply boundary conditions. Actually, we need to do something, something else. Um, let me go back for a while because I, I got rid of the basic drawing, but actually I need it to create an extra point. So I can press Ctrl Z. Okay. Um, I select all the faces. Oh. Okay, I just need to use this one. So select and I want to visualize only uh, this geometry. So I go here in home and I press show. So basically it will hide everything but this one. I need it because I need to create a point exactly in the center. Okay, so I can take advantage of using OSNAPS. So I can go from here to here and then I will create a point exactly in the middle. Why? Because we are going to do a displacement control analysis and we need to monitor the displacement at the center. Now the problem is that at the center, we have a brick and I don't want to cut it. So I will create a floating node and I will attach it to the nearest brick using a rigid body constraint. So I create a node here 
And now I can get rid of all the other geometries. So I go back in full selection and I get rid of them. Cancel. So I have only the node here and all the surfaces. Now I can go back here and show everything. So show all. And then I go in geometry and I press Sew Faces so that I can select all faces, right click, so that they will be merged in just one face. So now all, all the geometries that we have are the, the entire surface for the model and our floating point. Now, of course, as I told you, our floating point that is here, let me go back in the middle, okay, it's here. It should be connected, as you can see, it, is not, it does not coincide with one of the physical boundaries of my wall. So how can I attach it to my shell? Uh, well, simply using a multipoint constraint. So I can go in interaction and I press, and I call it, let's say, control node to shell link. And I press OK, and this one will be the master node, right click, and this face here will be the slave node, okay? And as you can see, it will create this kind of uh, connection. And we will use it later on to create a rigid body constraint between the two parts, so they will be connected. Okay, so next thing that we need to do is to create the element property because we pressed some control Z. So we need to create it again. Here, add shell element. Render model shells and we choose the shell MITC4. Okay, then we select this geometry and we drag and drop the shell element. So we have both physical property and element property already set. Now we need to set up all the boundary conditions. So um, as you can see here from the paper you have a detailed description of the experimental setup. Now you go pretty fast. If you're interested, you can go here and visualize all the details. So we go in condition. First of all, I want to switch off the grid because I don't need it. Okay, so first we want to apply the fixity along the uh, Z direction. Uh, so I go in front view. I go in condition and I click on fix. And I give it this name, fix Z. Uh, constraint, single point constraint, fix, 3D, three dots, and I want to fix only the Z displacement at all the base points. Okay, and press OK. Actually, I selected the entire, so both vertices and edges because I want everything to be constrained. Okay, so press OK, and here I have a distributed constraint of fixity along the z direction. Then, then we need to fix everything about the y direction. And in y direction, uh, we have a question. For some reason, I don't see the question when I'm in full screen. OK. No, 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 okay, no. It was a false error. Um, perfect, so we are here. Uh, fix in Z direction, this is fine. Now I need to create an extra condition for the fix it in Y direction. So fix Y. Um, constraint, single point constraint, fix 3D UR. And I'm going to fix in the y direction all the vertical edges here. So I can go in left view and I select these vertical edges. They cannot move in y. And also, uh, what else? OK, top and bottom lines. So I go back here. All the top line here and the bottom line here cannot move in y. Okay, so this is the selection, as you can see also this one. The selection for the displacement fix it in Y and press OK. And then we need to fix the displacement in X direction. So fix X. <clears throat> Model constraint SP fix. 
uh, 3D, displacement rotation, UX. And for UX, we want to select all these C profile here. So I can still go in the left view. Not actually, not in the left view, but it's easier if I select these ones from the left view. And then I go in the front view and I select all the lines behind this point, all the lines behind this point, and also down here. Okay, so this is my selection. So all this C and C over here, and everything will be fixed in X. Perfect. So this one is the C here, and the C here is fixed. Perfect. So this one is good for the fixes. Now, what else do we need? Okay, so we need something else. Now, um, the top view, the top uh, face of this wall, in a first stage of the analysis, we will we will apply a, an imposed pressure up here but the experimental setup is made such that the displacements of this line of the, this top line will be the same in every point so we can use an equal dot constraint but before doing that we need an, um, an interaction so we go back in geometry or interaction here and we need to create an extra interaction pretty much like the one that we created for the control node and the surface so we go here and we call it um, top uz equal dot interaction. We press OK. And we choose a master node. Now in this case, since it is an equal dot, it is not important what node do I choose because there is no rotation involved. Uh, it's just an equal dot in displacement. So I choose one of them pretty much in the middle. Then right click. And then I select all the slaves. So all the other entities at the same level, like this. Right click. And so this one will be my interaction for the equal dot. So I can go back in condition. And now I can assign a multipoint constraint to this interaction in such a way that all the slave nodes will move in the z direction equal to the uh, master node. So I go in condition and I click add. And I call this one top equal dot in z i go under model constrain uh, multi-point constraint equal dot 3d you are and then i click uz and i select this interaction here and press ok perfect so we have the equal dot in the top wall then this one will be used in the first analysis to make sure that the wall goes downward of the same at the same uh, of the same amount in the top level okay then after that they fix they uh, they fix the displacement at the current position and then they start pushing the wall so how do you fix a displacement at the current position in open seas you cannot use the fix because if i use the fix and i choose zero it will be fixed at zero but taken as an absolute value so if it if it was going down due to the vertical load then it will go back to the zero displacement so we don't want to do that. To fix it, to fix something at the current position when we don't know what is what will be that current position during the analysis, we can use this trick basically. So let me call this boundary condition fix uz um, top. But instead of using fix under constraint, I go under load and I choose single point constraint. Which is pretty much the same, but it has an extra uh, it has an extra tool that we inserted in STKO. So I use 3D UR, then I select only UZ, and then I choose zero. Now by default, if I choose this one, this kind of constraint, it will behave exactly like a fix. But then we have a uh, we have an option here that is not available in OpenSeas, but basically is an automatism that we have in STKO. If we click on relative, then basically, when we go and write the tickle file, instead of writing zero, we write this value plus the value of the displacement at the current time in the analysis. Okay, so basically, this one will mean okay, I want to keep the top of the wall fixed at the current position. Okay, but don't forget to use relative; otherwise, it will go back to the zero position. 
So this one is fine and I want to assign it to the top edge. Okay, so I go in the front view and I select all the entities in the top of the wall and I press OK. So this constraint will be applied on top. This is fine. Then what else do we need? We need to apply a constraint, an extra multipoint constraint. So we have three single points constraint, then an equal dot, a fixity at the current position. Then we have we need one extra multipoint constraint to attach the control node to the shell. So we can call it C node to shell link. And we go under constraint, multipoint constraint, and we choose rigid link in 3D using the beam. So basically everything will be uh, constrained, both displacement and rotation. And I select uh, this interaction here and press OK. So we have also this one. Now we need to apply the loads. We have two loads. Totally. So the first load is a vertical load here for the initial analysis. As you can see from the paper, we are analyzing the first example, which will be this one. And it has a vertical pre-compression of 0 0.1 megapascals. Okay, now since we have, so how do we apply a distributed load in OpenSys? You know that in OpenSys you have nodal loads. You don't have distributed loads on the boundaries of a shell or of a solid. But in STKO, you have it. But basically, STKO allows you to enter this distributed load. But then STKO automatically do, does the nodal lumping. So ultimately, in OpenSys, you will see nodal loads. But it's easy, at least, because now you can input um, distributed load. So the vertical load, I go under model, load, force, and I choose edge force. Edge force is basically a load which is distributed on edge, so force per unit length. Now, in this case, since they want to apply 0 0.1 megapascals to a thickness of 110, so we need to apply here in the z direction minus 11 Newton per unit length. Okay, and then I select all the vertical lines. So this one is fine. I'm going to select all the vertical lines, all the horizontal lines, sorry, on the top of the wall and press OK. So here we have this distributed load pointing pointing downward and then we need one last load which is the pressure in the front face which is it which instead will be used in the displacement control analysis okay so um before doing that i want to apply actually a distributed load so um load per unit area in such a way that the resulting force here is one why do i want to use a unitary force because then when i do the displacement control analysis i can use the lambda so the current time step in open seas that in the displacement control analysis is exactly equal to the entire to the load multiplier but since the reference load is one i can take the lambda as the entire force okay so that's why it's easier now let's say you want to apply a surface pressure in such a way that is its integral over the over the space is one. So you can go in query, and I want to select the entire all the faces in the front view. So I go back, I go on top view, I select all the faces here, and then I go here and I property and query area. Okay, so here you have the entire cumulative area. So you can take the, this one, you do one divided by this one, and you have the value to assign here in such a way that its integral will be one. Okay. So with this selection, I go here in condition, I click add, and I call it uh, phase force. I go in model, loads, force, uh, phase force. I select all the front faces. Okay, and the value that I have to assign in the global y direction is 1 divided by the total area, which is, let me see here, 9.8913 e minus 8 in the positive direction, yeah. 
So press OK and OK. So basically here I assign a distributed load in such a way that its integral is equal to one. So now we have all the boundary condition, um, all the uh, forces, they're fine. And then what else do we need? All the boundary condition are fine. Uh, we need to start with the analysis now. So let me save it. So the first analysis step as usual will be the recorder, model, recorder, and PCO recorder. And we call it results, this is fine. We want displacement, reaction force, rotation are fine, we can use them. And then let's say we want something, something else. We want to record, for example, stresses, um, forces and deformation on, the, on all the shells. So we can use the section force and section deformation. This one means I want to record the result force and result deformation on every integration point, so on every section of all my shells. And then let's say I also want to record something at the fiber level because we are using fiber cross section for the shells. So we can select section fiber strain and stress if you want to record the stress tensor and strain tensor in every fiber. And let's say you want to record something different, something that is not available among the built-in element results. For example, our material model, the damage TC3D, has an extra variable called damage. So if you want to record something that is not available among the built-in list, you can go here under custom and you can type it, okay? So in this case, we press, we make room for one. We want to record damage. Damage is a variable defined on the material level. So in every fiber cross section, in every fiber of every those points. So here we can write section, section dot fiber dot damage. Damage, okay. This is fine, and then I press OK. So the recorder is fine. Now we need to start by assigning boundary condition. So add boundary condition. Then we go under pattern, add pattern, uh, constraint pattern, single point constraint. So we have three of them the fix in Z, fix in Y, and fix in X. Perfect. Then we have some multi-point constraint. Uh, we have one for the pulled off and one for the uh, control node to shell. So the top you pulled off and the control node to shell link. Okay, and okay. Perfect. Now let me save it. Now we need to create the vertical load, but before doing that, we need, as we did in the previous example, some time series. So we need a linear time series to apply the vertical load. So I call it linear. Then I go in time series, I choose linear. That goes from zero to one, this is fine. And then since I'm here, I will create another time series, which instead is a constant. I will tell you why in a second. But I need also a constant time series. Perfect. Okay, so now let's apply the vertical load. So add. Vertical load model um, pattern add pattern load pattern linear. I go under load and I choose vertical, not the face force because that one will be applied in the displacement control analysis. So okay and okay. So at this point of the analysis, we have the record the boundary conditions, vertical loads. Then we can run the first analysis, okay? So uh, vertical analysis. Vertical analysis has the following settings. So I go here in analysis, analysis common, static, um, penalty method, one to the power of 15. Okay, now I will start by trying to run this model in sequential and then I will do it in parallel. So I start with the reverse uh, standard number, then the system we use the UMF path, which is fine, Newton method, displacement control increment test, and I want to print what's going on in the first analysis. Then we use a load control and we use just 
one step because the vertical load is very, very small, so we do not expect any nonlinearity here. Then, of course, I want to keep the vertical load constant, so I click on the load constant and then I reset the pseudo time step to zero. Okay, so here we have the vertical analysis, and then we need to assign all the other things in, for the second stage. So, the first thing that we want to do is to keep the vertical displacement fixed at the current position, so after the vertical analysis. So we go here and we choose add fix uz. We go under pattern, add pattern, load pattern. And here we need to assign to, uh, to use the fix uz, which this time is a single point constraint. So we go here and we can find it here, fix uz on top. And now here we need to specify a time series. Now we cannot use a linear time series. Why? Because we specified that this displacement should be fixed to zero, but zero is actually only, re uh, only relative to the current value. Instead, at this point, actually the displacement has a value. And if we use the linear, the linear time series, the analysis will start from the absolute zero down to the current value. Instead, we want to keep it fixed at the current value. That's why I created the constant time series, okay? So here we use the constant, meaning that, okay, you are at a certain position, I want to fix it, I mean, to fix you at the current position up to the end of the analysis, okay? And now we need to, to use, to apply the horizontal pressure. So I go here in add, add pressure, model, pattern, at pattern, load pattern. And this time we want, well, actually it's not important to use a linear time series because we are going to use a displacement control analysis. So it is not important what time series we use. So we go under load, we make room for one and we choose phase force. Okay, and okay. And finally, we need to define the horizontal analysis, okay? Uh, actually, we can, instead of creating a new analysis from scratch, we can duplicate, we can clone the vertical analysis because it will be pretty similar. And then we are going to change it. But before doing this, since we are going to do a displacement control analysis, we need to create a selection set for the control node because it will be requested here. So I go in selection set and I create a new one. Then I select this point, right click, select and then right click to accept the command for the selection set and then it says okay give me a name and we can call it control node set okay so here now we have an extra selection set that can be used for example here to select what we put it inside it okay and in this case it will be this node here selected okay so we have a selection set for the control node now we can go down here to the to the horizontal analysis we can edit it and we can we can we call it horizontal analysis. The static penalty, this is fine. Um, the only thing that we have to change is instead of being a load control, it will be a displacement control. The selection set for the control node is this one. And then we want to control the displacement along the y direction, so dot number two. And the increment, well, uh, in this case, we need to reach 35 millimeters. And we want to use 100 steps, so we should input here 0 0.35. And then we need to specify 100 here. And we don't need to use the load constant. Now, actually, this one is the standard way of running 100 steps in OpenSeas. But let's say we want to do something different. For example, we, want, we don't want to run 100 steps at a time. We want to run one step at a time. and between one step and the other, we want to do some custom operation. So how can we do this? So first of all, we need to specify this one and we click zero here. We just enter zero. Then we will run the time steps later on manually. And one extra thing, I don't want the test command to print anything because I will use a custom printing. So I will show you how. So in this way, you click OK. So this one is just a definition of the analysis and then Whenever you want to do something custom in STKO that is not available among the custom commands in STKO, the built-in commands, you can use a custom command. Custom command is nothing but a tickle script. So you go under analysis, uh, sorry, Michelin's command, 
and custom command. And here you can input your own script. So you will, you will have a tickle editor here and you can write whatever you want. Now in this example, I already prepared a script that you can use, which is this one. So you can open it, custom script. You can copy paste everything. You can copy it and paste it here. Now we'll just give you a brief description of what it is doing. So first of all, it tries to measure the entire duration because I want to show you the difference between the sequential and the parallel version. And here it ends the, the timing. Then basically it runs the analysis one step at a time. And whenever it solves one step, it tries to do something. So it asks for the number of iteration, the last norm that I obtained, it writes something only if it is on processor zero, because you will see that when we have many processors, each test command will write something. And this is kind of annoying when you have many processors. So in this case, you have a clean output. And then among each step, we want to write something on a file. That's why we created this file here, only if we are on processor zero. And then we close the file here. And what we do, we actually compute the entire displacement at this point. We get the time, but as we know, the time in this analysis is the total force because my horizontal force is equal to one. This one is the area. And so here I put my pressure in kilopascals because I want to compare it with the experimental results, which is given in kilopascal. Okay. And then I write one line for the file that will be used by this plot command here. Okay. And like this, you can do whatever you want. So whatever is custom. Okay. So let's press OK. I think we are done. So we can save it. We just need to mesh it. So we go under mesh, global seed. Now, in this case, we want to be pretty fast. So we choose only one division per element. And you will see that it is fine for this kind of large model because you don't need to, to use a very fine mesh here. So assign done. And then I need to apply some mesh controls. So phases structured and for exa and i want to select all the phases and assign it uh, structure and code excitation okay assign and done and then i can mesh it okay so we have all our mesh here we are fine we can save it and we can run the analysis now now this one will be the sequential analysis okay you will see that it's sufficiently fast but let me let me go back here Okay, I hope I made everything well. Okay, so let's wait for a while and then I will stop it. Uh, actually, I put something wrong here. Um, ah, okay, uh, I forgot to create, before you run the script, you need to create a folder, which is called graphs. Actually, I'm going to copy paste this one and this one from here to here, okay? So that now I can open it, I can click from this one and I can update it as the analysis runs. Okay, so let me run it again. Okay, now the first analysis has been done. Now it is starting the second analysis. And of course the, the, the graph has been uh, removed and now it is writing the graph one step at a time as you can see here you can update it and you can see what's going on now as you can see here in sequential it is taking about 10 seconds each step okay even more probably now i don't want to get annoying but this one will take almost 1000 seconds so i'm going to stop it and i will show you the difference with the parallel version so as you can see every step here takes about 10 seconds for a total of 1000 seconds so let's say you have a model like this one which is already set up for sequential analysis now you want to make it parallel so how can you do it well first of all you don't need to change anything the only thing that you need to change are the analysis steps so in standard analysis steps i mean analysis steps that are not displacement control you just need to change the number to the only one that is available for parallel processing which is parallel reverse CMK, CMN, and then you need to change the system to MAMPS. And here you're fine. And you do the same for the horizontal analysis. So you change the number 
uh, sorry, the parallel number. You change the system to MAMPS. And then here, but just here, you need to do an extra thing. Since you're using a displacement control analysis, for parallel processing, there is the parallel displacement control, okay? So you go here in parallel and you assign the same property. So control node, second degree of freedom, and 0 0.35 of increment. So these are the only changes you need to do here in the work tree. And then you need to do one extra thing. You go in mesh and you need to partition it. For example, in this computer, I have eight processors. So I can just go here in partition and press eight. Now you can click on partition, it will give me a preview of the partition. Let's say it is fine for me. And I click on done. Okay, while I'm done, the only thing that I need to do is to switch to the open CSMP solver and I run it. Okay. Now basically it will override what I was doing before. As you can see now it takes almost 1.5 seconds each step. It's much faster than, than the, the sequential one. Actually, we, we counted the, the speed up here. With a processor, we have a speed up of, of seven, which is not, of course, eight, which is the ideal the idea speed up, but it's much, much uh, it's very good for a speed up, uh, as you can see here. Okay, so we can wait. It will take about uh, one minute and a half or two minutes. Is almost done. Actually, I think even less than one minute. So basically, here I told you how to, to do this entire model, how to use a custom script here for doing whatever you want. Now, in this example, I just show you how to do a better printing with the percentage of the analysis so you know where you are, how to create a custom um, plot that you can monitor at runtime so during the analysis this is very advantageous when you're doing um, complex and time consuming analysis so you can see uh, step by step what's going on if, it, if everything is going good or not so you can monitor it it is almost done 90 percent let's wait a second Okay, and we are fine. And so we can go and look at the output. So we go here. Now, the only difference is that when you move from sequential to parallel, in the sequential version, you had only one file, which was called exactly as you named it. We named it results. So you will see results.mpco. When you do parallel analysis, also the output is partition, one for each process. Now, don't worry because you don't have to import them one by one. You can just select one of them randomly, let's say this one. You press OK, and then thanks to the uh, name convention that we use, STKO understands that this one is actually part of a partition database. So it will open automatically all the databases and treat them as if they were just one database. So you can just pick one of them. Open. And it will open all the other databases, as, as you can see here. Okay. As usual, you will start with a, with a standard plot, which is the deformed shape. I don't want to see it. I go in surface color map. And let's say what's going on. For example, we can increase the deformation scale to 30. So we can see what's going on in terms of displacement. And as you can see also here, the shear defor the transverse shear deformation is very important because as you can see, basically the entire failure is basically made of out of plane shear which is this sliding of the mortar joints in the other plane direction. Okay, so let's see what's going on. You can animate it to see what, what is actually happening. Or let's say you want to see something different. Here we are looking at a nodal values like the displacement, but let's say we want to visualize the deformation at the, uh, the shell integration points. So we can choose deformation, we can choose the maximum in plane deformation to have an idea of the crack opening. If you don't see them very well because there is kind of, it's kind of um, limited inside the, uh, the mortar layer, we can use nodal average so we can see what's going on here. 
Now we can animate this one to see the formation of cracks and the localization of the formations. Here it's pretty clear. And then of course you can visualize results also on the fibers. I think we are almost done. If you want to visualize, for example, stresses and strain at the material level or, or probably the damage, for example, you can use the beam shell fiber color map. When you use it, as you can see, instead of visualizing just one point for each integration point, you see an array of points for every integration point, which are basically all the fibers, sorry, all the fibers assigned to a given integration point. Now, in this case, I'm visualizing, for example, the damage, okay, the damage index. Um, in cases like this, for example, when you have a variable that runs from zero to one, you may want to, for example, to restrict the range. For example, I want to see only the areas where the damage goes from 0 0.9 to, to one. So you can select them and STKO will only show you the, the integration points where you have these values, for example. Okay. And in the same way, you can visualize the stress and strain tensor in every points. For example, let's say I want to visualize the strain tensor using vector plot. So I can go here. By default, the vector plot is using the displacement, but I can change it to fiber strain, for example. And I will see a strain, um, a tensor representation for the strain for the strain vector at every point, at every integration point. So you can do pretty nice, um, pretty nice post-processing using this kind of tools. Okay, so I think we are done for the webinar today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, please. We have some minutes for questions. Yes, Nicole. Um, if we want to consider the mortar brick interfaces, which are the important, which are important in masonry walls, how to do that? What about reinforcement for reinforced masonry walls? Well, um, okay, I'm going to answer to the question of Leon and then of Nicola Tarke. Uh, so basically, in this case, um, I prefer to represent the uh, mortar joint interface into a single model. So it depends on what you want to do, for example. In the mortar layer that I created here, I assign material properties in such a way that they represent the entire mortar and mortar brick interface. If you want to do a complete detailed analysis, so mortar and the interface between mortar and brick, you need interface elements, but uh, at the moment they are not available in OpenSeas, even though we are working on it. So we are working on assigning, actually there are the material models. Uh, we are creating an, an interface model. The problem is that there, is, there are no interface elements in OpenSys. There are only zero length uh, uncoupled springs. So for the moment it cannot be done, but we are working on it. And if you want to do reinforcement, you can do the same. Probably you can, you can think of creating another webinar for reinforced masonry. But of course you can mix everything here. So for example, even reinforcement is not a problem. You can use reinforcements, you can use, it depends on how you want to model it, uh, but you can do it. Um, then Nicola Tark. Okay, Nicola Tark, if, oh, there are some elements that allow the physical separation between elements. Um, and this is kind of related to the question of Leon. Um, to represent, in this case, since we are using continuum elements, what we are doing is a smeared approach. A smear crack approach. If you want to model physically a displacement jump, you need interfaces, okay? Um, or advanced numerical methods such as extended finite element method, which is not available in OpenSys. So it's kind of related to Leon's question. We are work, we are working on uh, creating interfaces in OpenSys, okay? Um, then we have another question from Raffaele De Risi. Okay. Um, about the large displacement has been mentioned before. What if you use shell decay GQ? Yes, um, if you want to use um, large deformation, 
uh, probably this was the question. If you use the shell NL DKGQ, you have large deformations. Okay. Um, in, if you use the formulation for the DKGQ or DKGT for the triangle, you have uh, you have large deformation just by switching to the other elements that have the NL uh, option inside the name. The problem is that, as I told you, the DKGQ does not have a very good uh, as a good plate bending behavior, but not for um, not for micro modeling because it has the thin plate theory. Then there is the shell MITC4 that is fine if you want to use it in large displacement. You can switch on. There is an option called a plate basis when you create the finite element, which is basically here. Um, just a second, I will show you. Which is here when you create the element. If you click on update basis, it will do a uh, nonlinear geometric analysis, but actually we have seen that it converts very poorly, the MITC. So we are working also on creating a new element that has a new shell element that has the rotational formulation for a very good performance. And we will keep you up to date also with that. Okay, so is there any other question? Okay, so if there is no other question, thank you to everyone for taking part in this webinar. And as you know, we are, we are giving monthly webinars, so keep on checking on our website and you will see the new upcoming webinars, okay? So thank you to everyone and hope to see you in the next webinars. Bye.